it's difficult to say what we do. I, I never studied to be a designer. I, I, um, I studied philosophy. Or when I say I studied philosophy, that's what I was supposed to be doing. But I kind of spent a lot of time being in bands and putting club nights on and things like that. So um, that'll give me some of the background. And I'm just going to talk through, um, as this is a kind of A to Z of the Designers Republic. Um, and it's designed to kind of give me an opportunity to talk about what we do and why. Um, I don't think I'll get through all of it, but, um, but we'll try. Um, okay, so that, that's our logo. Uh, this is our offer. Uh, a is for... A is for architecture. Um, poignantly. Um, we've, we've been involved with various architectural practices, doing various different things uh, over the last... Uh, 29 years and um, but, it, but it's really the influence and the influences come primarily um, apart from the aesthetics and the structure and and the fact that graphic designers often find architecture fascinating because it's a it's a three-dimensional we, we, we see it as a three-dimensional extrusion of, of graphic forms obviously architects see it differently um, and those people who live in the buildings that they build necessarily see it differently but um, we're kind of interested in this, and so this this uh, this particular one is a is a record cover for a, a band um, that we work with uh, from England called Orteca, um, and it's and it's literally uh, you obviously you can tell it's falling water, um, and what happened was we uh, I had a kind of epiphany one time when I went to New York, and you know, I kind of it was, my, it was my first visit to New York, and I kind of got the New York neck where you know you're walking around like this just for days, just looking at buildings and things. And, um, and, I, and, and, and basically, it, 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 a lot of, another thing that we were doing at the time was we were really influenced by consumerism. So we were using barcodes in our, in our, in our art, in our design work, um, as graphic elements rather than just as a, as a functional thing. And I walked past the, uh, the Exxon Towers um, in New York, and, and it suddenly struck me that that was like, two huge barcodes and I kind of started to think about how things were you know if you squint and you see sort of three dimensions sort of reduced to two dimensions um, and so I kind of spent a week walking around New York uh, squinting like kind of looking at things as, as a two dimensional thing and this sort of led on to looking at different structures and 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 um, Using using sort of the, the three dimensional world as, as, a, as an inspiration for for creating two dimensional designs, and then so we start off by reducing uh, architecture or three dimensional sort of forms um, into two dimensions, um, and then we started to one of the interesting things really was that a lot of designers talk about um, architecture, but actually we don't really know that much about it, and most of what we do know. Uh, or, or most of what we think we like, we actually um, we only experience it in books. So you know, we kind of you know we kind of go out and buy our books about architecture and, and look at them and you know kind of wonder about it. But really, a lot of it's just about the surface. Um, and we just worked on a, a, a video um, for, again for Orteca um, with, with a video director called Chris Cunningham, and he. In this video, he basically built a lot of machines. In this video, and he uh, just in this video, he, they, they, in this video, they look like in this video, weird or he, in this video, robot machines, but actually they don't video, exist. He, so we were kind of we were kind of inspired by this. We started he, to rebuild he, the buildings he, in a way that kind of we, we kind of prefer them to be. Um, and this, so this one was uh, for a cover for Sebastian Tomey, and then also. Um, we did a book with uh, Boston Sarabuga, um, which was uh, 3D, 2D, and again, so this is, this is, um, I think this is, is this, no, this isn't the Chamber of Commerce, this, I think this is Frankfurt Airport, but, it, but it's, it, it's, it's how it should have been built. Um, uh, anyway, so A, that's our So A is also for aim, low and miss, that's one of our um, mantras, one of our philosophies. Um, my company went, went bust in 2009 um, and that was after two, three years of making a, a lot of money doing corporate work with the likes of Coca-Cola um, and after two or three years of being really unhappy and sitting in board meetings, um, board meetings, 
Um, and, and so Amy and I missed kind of about, um, I haven't got time to go into all of it, but it's, it's really um, Quentin Crisp said, uh, if at first you don't succeed, maybe success isn't your style. And, in, and I think in the world nowadays, there's so much pressure uh, for us to see success in terms of, of acquisition. Um, and not only acquisition, but acquisition relative to your neighbours or your peers. Um, and that doesn't really interest me. Um, Bob Dylan, who, who, who says some interesting things, but, but sings like a goat, um, said, uh, what is success? Success is waking up in the morning, doing what you want to do all day, and then going to bed happy. So that's really what we try to do. So aim low and miss. It's um, it's just a it's a it's a publication of t-shirts, club nights, uh, events, all sorts of things, and under this banner. Um, a is also for um, atoms, vectors, pixels, ghosts. Um, but somebody um, in an interview, they, they, they asked us about our creative process, and in a, with a blinding um, flash of inspiration, I, I said it, our, our process was atoms, vectors, pixels, ghosts. Um, and that is that um, <coughs> we're influenced by everything that we see. There are, there are no specific influences, there's no hierarchy of influence for me. Um, so whether it's a sweet wrapper on the floor in the street, or, or a piece of uh, high art, or uh, a logo flying past you on the motorway on the side of a truck, um, or lorry. Um, so it's all that we're surrounded by atoms and what we try to do is we try to make sense of them. So we take them from being atoms, we try to make something sort of straight and, and concise and uh, like, like vectors. So we turn them into vectors and that becomes our design. Um, but the relevance of those designs, both to an audience and also to, to a creative who's always looking to move forward and do something new, um, they, they kind of turn into the analogy of, of it in graphic design from vectors, which is your hard edge uh, lines, into pixels, which is more fuzzy. So they kind of turn into pixels, and then eventually they become ghosts, and because they disappear and they dissipate. So it's part of, partly the creative process, but it's also about it's also about how memory works, and I guess how memory works uh, becomes more relevant the older you get. Um, and the more you have to remember, and maybe the less those memories are important because there's so many. Anyway, so the next thing, hopefully it'll work, is, is just a, a really short film, um, which is... So Atoms, Vectors, Pixels, Ghosts uh, forms. It's, um, it's, it was originally designed to be huge projections, which you'll see, but it also, it can also be prints. Um, we had a, a huge installation in Sheffield, a sort of a 200 metre installation outside the railway station. Um, and so it could be it could be a lot of different things. So it's it's, it's individual images, but they're they're originally intended to be shown really quickly. So it's it's, it's ideas happening and, and, and bursting and dissipating. Um, so hopefully this might give you an idea.
similar idea so the music in the in the film was by Autech and the reason I'm in it is because that's actually um, a rough edit from a clip from a, a documentary that um, a, a, t a, a film company is making about the Zanish Republic um, so this this is really um, this is actually a, a font a, the original font was uh, a computer font but we see it as, a, as being a computer font and one of the things that interests, um, another thing that interests me is the idea of fast history. And, and the further, and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and the increase of the pace which we, with which we, we try to kind of head towards the future. Um, what's going to happen in the future? We want to know what the future holds and things. The present is kind of um, almost forgotten. Um, so we, we, we like this idea of like fast history. And, and what was interesting about this is that um, so this is basically just a, a print that we made um, to sell, but, but to celebrate um, 21 years of working with Orteca. Um, but the font is actually uh, was designed by Franco Brignani in 1965. So the idea is that, that, that people now, Orteca fans now, assume that this is deliberately a, a very much a, a computer font that relates to electronic music and digital music. Um, but the idea is that it's up, it's it's from back from 1965. Um, this is another A. Um, I'm not, not going to get through the whole line clearly. This is another A. This is um, this is a cover we did for another uh, Warp artist, a Warp Records artist called Aphex Twin. Um, and again, he's um, he's like the godfather of um, electronic music in in the not in the the big sense, but in the kind of the sense of, uh, sort of post 90s electronic music, dance music stuff. Um, uh, he did an album, his last album was called Syro, and um, he, he hadn't released an album for 11 years. And the reason that he didn't was because he's, he, he's kind of fed up with the, um, with the with music being perceived as product. So people talk in terms of buy, I'm buying an album, and what they say is they're buying an album is people talk about. Oh, I, I only buy vinyl, or I only buy CD. But actually, shouldn't you be saying, I like to buy music, or actually, I like to listen to music, or engage with music? So for 11 years, he, he didn't put anything out. And then, um, for some reason, uh, a couple of years ago, he decided to, to start. Well, he told the record label he was starting work on a new album. The fact is, is that he had something like 2,000 tracks available so he kind of just they kind of said we need a new album and he gave, they, so they gave him an advance and he just gave them some of his tracks um, so the idea behind this was was to was to to treat um, to treat an album uh, and to talk or, or, or to design the album in such a way that you're referencing the product and not the music because the music isn't the product and so if you look in the if you look in the, 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 the I'm trying to use this Thing that Simon's given me. Hang on. No, I'm not going to try to do that. Technology's defeated me again. But anyway, so the bit, the bit where you can see the list at the top is actually it's a list of every single cost involved in the manufacture um, or the promotion or distribution of the album, and it's expressed as a percentage cost of what you paid for the album itself. So let's say you paid 15 euros for this album. Then all of these um, all of these costs <coughs> add up to fifteen euros or fifteen pounds in the UK release case. So it's literally so it, it's not just the recording cost; it's a cost of sandwiches at a PR event, or the cost of a taxi to or or, or a courier to bike the master tapes uh, or, the, or the masters across to get um, to be cut onto vinyl. So, it, so the idea is it's a complete deconstruction of, of everything um, about the album, um, and the so we decided on a, on a particular font size 
that, that kind of looked like a, a receipt that you get from a, a, from a, a shop. And, and then we listed out the thing, and, and when we looked at the format of the album, um, it basically, the, the number of gatefolds on the album is determined by the length of the list. So I think it's like four gatefolds out and, and longer on the CD. Um, C is for Coca-Cola. Um, we did some stuff with Coca-Cola. I can't. D is for uh, destroy minimalism. We did it. We um, we had a we had a whole lot of sketchbooks well, you know, as as you would. Um, and in um, so destroy minimalism doesn't really mean anything other than it's the opposite of celebrate minimalism, which could be equally true. Um, but this was just from a. It, Really, what it means to me, destroy minimalism, is is not so much in the the, the, the traditional sense of what minimalism is, as in the lack of uh, detail, lack of decoration, but destroy minimalism, minimalism as in terms of minimal thought, and minimal input, and a, a sense of especially in graphic design, but I think also it, it probably applies to architecture as well. That the things that the people often design something to be minimal as an excuse for actually thinking about it. So I'm going to build a white cube, so I'll do that. But what's the reason you're building a white cube? So for me, the minimalism is, is what it is, but there should be a reason that you do that, and that reason could be really, really complex. Um, but this, this sketch was from a, a notebook, and we put it into a, a magazine, in, a Norwegian magazine called Hot Rod, and um, they, asked, they wanted to do a, 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 an issue dedicated to the Designers Republic. Um, and we couldn't think what to do, so it was at the time when there was a, there was a, a trend in the music industry for having unplugged albums like Nirvana Unplugged or, or whatever. So we thought we'd do a Designers Republic Unplugged and just have stuff from sketchbooks. Um, this, is the, this is kind of the very opposite, really, of, of Destroy Minimalism. This is one of the things that, that working with computers um, or technology allowed us to do that, that we couldn't do. So the downside of working with, with te technology is that it's it is easy to just boot up a, boot up your software and start designing. Um, and but sometimes you know because you have function keys, you, it it doesn't give you the time that we the, well, the time that we had before was working with computers when we do mechanical artwork on big sheets of uh, graph board and things. That that was that took time, and during that during the time that it took to work in that way, you could evolve an idea, and that's kind of how I still work. So, with this, what we what we were doing was um, there was another thing that probably comes from my my, my background, sort of pretending to study philosophy, and that and that is that um, there's there, there is no one truth. There's no one particular truth. Everything is dependent on perspective and context, and one of the things that, that this multi-layering um, approach allowed us to do was to rather than think of all the different ideas and then distill that down into, into one graphic communication, it allowed us to actually kind of build up layers and layers and layers of all the different ideas that we had that we could then cut through and almost dig down um, into the design and to reveal other sort of bits and other bits of the, of the, of the artwork that were on the lower layers. Anyway, so this was this is just this is just a, a part of a project, a, a personal project that we did, that was called Department Stores Around New Cathedrals, which again links into the consumerism and the barcode stuff. Um, D is also for destination. Um, I, was, I was thinking about tourism um, quite a lot before I came, obviously, and we do a lot of work with we do a lot of um, location branding, and and actually I think that that. In the context, so let's let's go back to what what you were talking about yesterday in, in terms of um, the Grand Hotel Fjord, and, and you, um, that isn't really about tourism for me. That's about destinationism. That's about a, a, attracting people to a particular place. And one of the things that I'm interested in is why people do what they do. Um, consumer, uh, consumerism as a, as a uh, an example. Um, so. Why do we spend our leisure time looking around shops when we don't really want to buy anything? You know, 
what are you doing at the weekend? I'm going shopping. I'm going window shopping. I'm not buying windows. I'm going window shopping. It seems really kind of like dumb when there's so many other things that, that we could do. So, so the idea of, of if you translate that back into sort of tourism or, or whatever, destinationism, it, it's whether it's, whether it's a, a building or a, or a location or, or even whether it's an event, there needs to be a story, there needs to be a narrative to, to attract people there. We're, we live in a, in a society where we're given so much information and, and much of that information is, is geared towards persuasion. Advertising persuades us that we need something that we never knew we wanted in the first place. So, so the idea is that if, 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 if you want people in the, in the old sort of the old uh, you know, futurist thing, but, but you know, if we build the hacienda, people will come. Um, I don't think that is true anymore. People need to have reasons. People want experiences. People people want things that they can own, have some ownership with. So that's why I, I think in terms of destinationism more than tourism. Tourism to me is the grand tour. It's 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 from the perspective of the of the person who maybe owned the hotel or putting on an event. Tourism is, is vague, it, it's people making random choices to go to different places. We don't want that, we want them to come to the place that, that we're creating. And so this, this is just various different things that we did. These, this is like personal projects. But these are just different things that we did when we were talking um, about destinationism to various uh, clients. Um, This is just, I mean, this is just, it's kind of purely aesthetic, really. It's, they're, they're inspired, obviously, by architectural drawings, but, but they aren't, they don't really mean anything other than to, get, to illustrate the fact that you need to attract people. So this is, this is one that we developed into a different idea. Um, your role as a target, target market explained, but it's really about attraction and, and that sort of thing. And these were other ones. This is something we did for um, a company that we worked with in Tokyo, and it's, again, it, it's talking about um, the specific travel in, in terms of relative populations, relative distances, relative uh, quick coordinates. And this is something that we did. This is this is a, an idea for uh, in terms of destinationism, in terms of uh, a documentary film festival in Sheffield. Um, it's a documentary film festival, and and one of the problems with that, I mean, particularly for a UK audience. That's, that's kind of plugged into the TV every evening, is, is why would you go, when you can see documentaries um, in a cinema, in, in, on TV, why would you go to the cinema? So what we, we, we wanted to try to create something that was more than that, so we, we, we had the idea of the truth is out there, but the truth is out there, the truth, truth is stranger than fiction. Um, and then we got, so we wanted to just have a, a, a story which we could carry, out, carry on through over various festivals. And, and there's, a, there's a saying in, in, in English, um, straight from the horse's mouth, which means that, you know, so we, we basically got this horse mask and we got someone to go around and we, 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 we I was going to say we stole, we borrowed um, without permission uh, a golf buggy from a local golf course and we got him to drive around Sheffield City Centre in a golf buggy with a, with a horse mask on. And this one was really, we went, he went to sort of, we filmed him filling up, pretending to fill up a petrol station. And then, <clears throat> so the idea was that um, people, a lot of people said they wanted action films at the cinema, so we thought we could Dirty Harry, um, with the horses and arms. Um, he is for Echo City. This was um, in 2006, I was one of the co curators of the um, British Pavilion. Um, at the Venice Biennale of Architecture, um, and it was based on the idea of Echo City. Um, what what could a city be? And the fact that um, so in, in Sheffield, um, a, as with anywhere, Kotor or wherever you all come, but for, but for us, Sheffield, um, there was there there is no one Sheffield. There's as many Sheffields as there are people living in Sheffield, or people visiting Sheffield, or even people who've heard of Sheffield and have some vision or imagination of it. And we all have different mind maps. My Sheffield is very different, say, to my neighbour who's a, who's a 68-year-old woman. I'm, I'm guessing it's different. Um, 
So, um, so, so, yeah, so anyway, the idea of Echo City, the story behind Echo City is, um, is what, what happened in, uh, in the Second World War. Sheffield was heavy industry, um, a lot of steelworks, obviously building a lot of uh, uh, ammunition and hardware um, for people to go and kill each other. And, um, but anyway, so the, the Germans were, were obviously keen to, to bomb Sheffield. And there wasn't much that they could do with it, and they couldn't have a blackout because of the huge furnaces, so you couldn't have a blackout of the city. You had to kind of have the furnaces open, so it was really visible from, from the sky. And, um, and so some students at the architecture school in Sheffield had this idea that actually at night a, a city is really only the lights that you can see. When you fly in from, you know, if you fly into a major city airport, you know, you don't really see anything but the brilliant patterns that the lights make and the, the, the road lights and other things. And what they did, um, so what they did was they decided to build a replica of Sheffield made out of uh, uh, um, like small fires or aircraft lights or, or whatever they could to get their holds up there, get their hands on to, to make it look as if it was a city. Um, so the, they worked out the best place to do this because it's surrounded by hills, it's, it's built on seven hills, light road. So they, what they decided to do was to build it on the moors to the north of Sheffield. And um, so that was great, already successful, apart from the fact that the the bombers approached Sheffield from the south. So they kind of hit Sheffield, dropped their bombs, and I guess as they were flying north to return back, they kind of really confused as to like whether they dropped them. Anyway, but the point was, it was a great idea, but you know, typically of, of Sheffield, a, a failure. So this is just the stuff that we, that we designed for the, um, for the location branding, if you like, of the British Pavilion at, in that, at that time. And this is just some other bits and pieces that we did. It was all about size and relative positions. It was also there was a lot of the, we, we got a lot of these images, and these were these were <coughs> images that various people had taken of their Sheffield, um, which we then took <coughs> and we built into. Uh, this was a huge. Uh, <coughs> when things get to be bigger than record covers, I start to lose perspective on what sort of size it was. But it was it was like a huge long wall in the British Pavilion. And really what it is, is it, it's, just, it's just sections of Sheffield um, sort of mapped into pixels. Uh, we, we, did a, uh, we did a magazine, uh, there's an American design magazine, or there was, called Emigre Magazine, and they, designed, they dedicated an issue to us. I'll move on from that. Uh, this is also Ease for um, EXD, which was Experimental Designs. Uh, it was the Lisbon Biennale of of design as opposed to triennale of architecture. And, and, and this is another example of really of, 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 of branding and, and messaging because what they had was it was um, every, every two years they, they'd have a different subject. And the, the, the subject they came up with was like, you know, so this year it was about, it was about time. And there's that sense, you know, oh, it's about time we did this, so it's about time for change, but it's also about time. And the, the problem with that, is that it, it appeals to the people who come to visit, to speak, um, and engage with the Binani in that way, but it doesn't really speak to anybody else. It's, it's kind of very dry and a bit kind of, um, I don't know, it's like, oh yeah, it's about time. <laughs> you know, it's a bit geekish, you know, whereas like, so we just did a whole lot of stuff where uh, we just had you now, wow, and, and that's sort of something that people wanted to wear on t-shirts. It was something that they kind of had massive billboards around Lisbon and, and it tripled the, the, the attendance because it, it made it something that kind of the general public might be interested by. F is for uh, fruit. Uh, that's just a picture of a, the coffee machine. But G is for Gate Crusher. It's a club in Sheffield, it's a rave club. Um, <coughs> There, there was a review. There's a review of uh, of, um, of the club, and it just said just all sirens and flashing lights, which we thought was a bit like, like an ambulance. So we kind of did, we, we rebranded it in the, in the, in the colourway of British ambulances. G is also for Ginza Graphic Gallery. This is this is just a shot from our first major retrospective in Tokyo. 
Um, the idea, again, it, it, it's, not, it's, 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 it's the, the, the other side of destroy minimalism, the idea that kind of um, less is less, but more is often more, even more. So we, we, we kind of took a, a quite, it's quite a large gallery space, but we made it so that it was really difficult to get by. And there was lots of pillars kind of in, in the space that, um, that meant you kind of had to squash and everything was, and, you, and, you, and every time you turned around, you got a, a, a you, intentionally, you got a different combination of, of all the different artworks, something new. Um, we did, we just recently rebranded uh, from the South Kaluska Benkian uh, in Lisbon. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about that now. And that's me and my son. And, and that, that was, uh, and they, they, they said we, we worked with the classical music department in, um, in at the Gulbenkian Foundation. And we, we rebranded that as Gulbenkian Musica. Um, and then they, so they released various albums, and this one was uh, Peter and the Wolf. Um, I'm the Wolf. Grr. Uh, H is for uh, Hey Rube. Uh, I, I, always, I always wanted to do. Um, a pastiche on, on um, um, Simon Garfunkel's bookends cover because I thought it's, it's, it's so because I think it's 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 one of the best covers in terms of it's just a portrait and it tells a it says so much even as a really simple image so quite I'm fascinated by it and then um, a few years ago um, Kruger and Dorfmeister from Vienna did a, a straight pastiche of it but this is basically um, this is basically sort of two let's say, aging musicians from the, from the UK sort of dancing. Um, and and the, artist, the, the idea really is, is that they're kind of putting on the makeup to make one more album um, before it all finishes. I is for, uh, this is just a screen print. Somebody asked us, um, <coughs> they, they, <coughs> they wanted us to do a promotional video for them, uh, B2B, business to business promotional video. Um, and they said, you know, and, and they wanted promotional material to go with it. It was a company called uh, Conan Wolf in, um, in London. And, and this, the, the guy that was commissioning us was just like, he's getting really excited. And he, he kind of said, well, what I really wanted to do, what he, I wanted to look like, like, like a black hole. I wanted, you know, if you, if you, could, if you could design something that's like a black hole. And because they said, well, apart from drawing a black hole, you can't really do that because the whole point of it, black. He said it needs to be the, the biggest thing you can imagine. So anyway, we, we, we kind of went through and explained it's difficult to graphically represent a black hole. Um, so they said, well, what about like a what about like a, a nuclear explosion or something? So then and then and then you, you had this phrase about the black hole. Is this doable? Is this doable? Is this doable? And it's kind of we we, we get that a lot and. and um, and I'm sure that you do too, of, of, of people who don't understand the process or the technology, of just imagining that you can do anything. How do you for time? Okay. Uh, I is also for Izzy Mayaki. We did, um, they asked us to, we did quite a lot of stuff for their stuff, for their um, fashion shows and the new season fashion shows um, graphically uh, in, 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 in Japan. And they asked us to, they had a series of t-shirts called, called, it was the Oval Project, and it was all about finding different ways to, to package and present um, t-shirts. Um, so we just took, we just got a t-shirt and, and vacuum packed it uh, into a little brick, and then you get a stencil, because on the t-shirt there's just white spaces for you to write your own message or write your own name. J is for uh, Jarvis Cocker. <coughs> this is, this is, I included this because there's a lot of stuff, obviously, with architecture, it's, it's all about spatial concepts and space. Um, and with graphic design, it's, it's, more, it's more of a conceptual thing. Um, we, couldn't, we, we couldn't think of an idea at first um, for this cover. Um, and then, and then and Jarvis is uh, he's from Sheffield, he's an old friend of mine, sort of before he became famous. If you had, is he famous here, Do you know Jarvis Cocker? No. Okay, good. And he's uh, anyway, he's a singer, and he's, he's quite well known for being very sort of wry and you know, humorous. But anyway, he wanted to do. Um, uh, he he take, he'd recently taken up Pilates, and so he said what he wanted to do was to maybe get into a box in an awkward shape and have be photographed there. 
and, and we sort of said, you know, it's, and not we, we realised that actually he couldn't really get into this box that we had because he wasn't he wasn't that supple. So anyway, what we did was we did this photo shoot with a guy, a uh, photographer from the UK called Rankin, who does a lot of fashion stuff. And what we did was we we, we got all the images, but we cropped them so that basically, you know, like this is the edge of the of the album cover, so that so the album cover and the album images became the box that he inhabited. Okay, it's for Kill Yourself. Um, this was this was part of, um, funnily enough, this was part of a project that we did, um, a personal project called New Optimism. Um, and, and, but Kill Yourself was much more about not committing suicide, but just, it's not, you know, the idea is not all about you, become self-obsessed. So the idea was just like, just kill yourself, stop being so self-obsessed. And the reason it, it's backwards is that it's on a t-shirt that we did for um, Liberty Store in, uh, in London. And it's backwards so that you only read it the right way around when you're gazing at yourself in the mirror. So that's it. And it's for uh, NFO, this is just an album cover. It's interesting that, that it's, it's all about the form of the, of the uh, product again in that you know you need to put it all together so there's a there's the cd there's the plastic case and then there's the um a, a plastic sheath the album's called sheath there's a plastic sheath this is just some other stuff we did the idea of <coughs> attracting people another shot another shopping area in sheffield that, that never actually happened cole's quarter so it just um how it kind of re how it renders out into the fact that sheffield's built on seven hills um and then just the idea of it, you know, you, you, if you're seeing it everywhere. Uh, another one was um, Chorley's uh, a market town in, in Lancashire. Um, you'll probably never go there. Um, but, but anyway, but the idea was that, uh, that they, had a, they, they had a shopping precinct that was being renovated by um, uh, Reef, uh, who were also doing the, the Moor in Sheffield. And the idea was that to go there, that it was, um, we talked about the heart of Chorley, and, and one of the things that the people, the, 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 the council in Chorley said, oh, you know, everybody in, in Chorley has a big heart, and it's a very friendly place, so this was the heart of Chorley, so it's just basically gifts made into a heart, to tell, you know, and, and, but also something that there's a, some, some kind of heraldic or historic um, basketry kind of thing, because it's a historic uh, market town. And the idea with it was that you could just you could use this device in different ways. So on the right it's more about the heritage and, and the old church that's there. And on the left it's always there would be if you're pushing sort of the new technology or the game stores or the TV uh, stores in the in the in the area it would be something like that. And then there's lots of different renderings and different versions that they're all the same but they give you it's something for everybody. And then this is the final location burning thing. This is we, we did something called um, Sheffield Culture, and, it, and it's basically it's the it's the cultural strategy document of, of Sheffield Council, um, and it's just about putting people. It's talking about people in terms of, of sport, people of different ages, genders, etc., backgrounds. Um, so that's that quite a nice book, which is which basically dresses up. A really, really dull document. Um, M is for um, this. Is, we, we did a lot of rebranding for Manchester School of Art, and we tried to work out um, for the final degree show one year. They, 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 they were talking about all the different things, and it ranges from architecture through to fashion and textiles, through to fine art, illustration, digital, plastic arts, uh, graphic design, etc. And what was the one thing that, that connects all of those, really? So we thought, you know, there's... What, what is the one thing that, that all of them uh, have in common? And that is, ask why. And one of the things when I teach my students, I kind of say that, you know, the, the, one, the one thing that I can give them that will be more useful than anything else would be the question why. Uh, that's an outcome cover from Loco. Um, I'll go to that one. Um, this is some work we did with um, Branson Coates in London. It's, uh, it's a, a, a Kaiten sushi restaurant in Canary Wharf uh, in London. Um, and 
the idea, the, the, the basic idea was to was to was to give a sense of, of, of being in Tokyo. So rather than just seeing you know a canary wharf looking out over a rainy uh, sort of Docklands view, to make it feel as if, as if it was you're in Tokyo. But the problem was was that there was a, at least half the space was glass windows looking out. So we couldn't control the all. You couldn't control the lighting, and you couldn't really give a sense of being in Tokyo because what was outside was was so impactful on, on what was inside. So, in a in a similar way to what we did for the um, thing uh, uh, in Echo City, we built um, a Tokyo a faux Tokyo skyline, and what we did was we, we being being a designer in Tokyo, we sort of slightly like anal. Most of the pictures I, I take in Tokyo are pictures of ATMs and small signs, etc. So what it is, is it's, it's a 30 metre long, two and a half metre high, sort of print onto canvas that is stretched across a frame. And that covers the window so you can't see out of the restaurant anymore. Um, so it, and it looks like a Tokyo skyline, uh, except that really it's just made up of, of, the, of the minute details of the city rather than the grand sky skyscapes um, and then all the tables have got uh, the names of various different uh, Tokyo subway stations and on and you can you can follow the route around and, uh, and it's for networking um, I really hate networking uh, it just it's, it's just everyone's sort of anyway I I really hate networking I'll leave it at that so and then there's a big thing that kind of a lot of the big ad, ad, ad agencies in the UK there's that it's more of an 80s and 90s idea but the sense that all the business deals are done on the golf course um, uh, or, or in the 19th hole or something so this is just this is a multi-story car park opposite our old office and it was interesting because they, they painted the, the, the car parking bays green um, and we asked, we asked why they painted it green and they said well so that it softens, it, it softens the whole image, so that it's not so just like a big concrete kind of structure. I mean, like, right, okay, but you can't see it from the ground, and the only time you can see it is if you drive to the very top, and the only time you drive to the very top is either if you're going to jump off, or if there's no space down below. So, and by the time you've driven up five levels of a multi-story car park, you're pretty clear that you're not in the country, and there isn't. Uh, any grass, anyway. So we decided to go and do a golf shoot over there. So we hired loads of golf gear. We got the same golf buggy again. And so that's that's the design of public. We did that as a promotional shot. They had the magazine in, in New York uh, said they wanted to, just a shot of us working. So we thought we'd do that instead. Sure. Okay. Your your choice. Nickelodeon. Uh, this is Nickelodeon Children's TV. I'll be quite quick on this one. And the reason I included this was, was that there was a sense of sometimes you, you develop an idea and you, and you, and you grow it and you, and you look at different routes and different ways you can roll out an idea. Sometimes it, it, it makes more sense to go back the other way. And we want to pitch to uh, rebrand Nickelodeon TV Europe. And basically what we did, um, at the time they had, they had loads of stuff that was all uh, their branding was really their products, so they had various TV programs, and they promoted themselves through their TV programs, so that the Nickelodeon as a as a as a brand itself became lost. So we said you should you need to go back to this, um, and we won it. Basically, the guy said afterwards, you know, the, the reason you won was because the first thing you said was when you came into the room to do the pitch was <clears throat> we're going to present you as a, a Stalinist approach to children's TV program branding. And he said, he said, basically, we all, he said, we all looked at each other and thought, you've won, um, and this is awful. But anyway, we just said, take, you know, get rid of everything else, and everything starts with Nickelodeon, because you watch it as a kid, so everything starts with Nickelodeon. Um, this is just something else, um, this is uh, North of Nowhere. This is another sketch from the, from the Hot Rod magazine with Destroy Minim Minimalism. <clears throat> this is a sketch that I did to explain to a journalist why Designers Republic was, didn't relocate to London. And, and basically, kind of from a northerner's point of view, everything kind of in the south 
is, is Shandy. Do you know what Shandy is? Okay, uh, Shandy is um, beer but with lemonade in it, which is, so it's, it's for kids, it's a bit soft. So obviously northerners see southerners as being soft. So basically kind of there's a, there's a, there's a boundary and you wouldn't be okay in London because you drink Shandy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tell you about this and then I'm going to stop. Um, this, um, be, people, people have a habit or almost an obsession with asking other people, what, what, what's your favourite piece of design you've done or what's your favourite piece of design someone else has done or something. And, and I'm like, I don't get it, I don't get why people want to have favourites. The thing that creative needs more than anything is options. I want to keep my options open. I like the sense that um, that it, you know that, that anything could happen, or that I can choose to, or I can change my mind. So I want to keep my options open. So I, so to me, choosing favourites, which is pointless anyway, because you're going to change your mind in the next day, the next hour, the next minute, or whatever. Um, anyway, so but if I have to say uh, a favourite album cover that I've done, one that I think that that sums up um, most accurately something about what I want to say or, or how I feel, then it's this. And it's an album called Oversteps, which is kind of irrelevant to the design. And it's another album, for, album cover for, for Orteca. And um, the brief background is that, that, that every time they do an album, they come in and they play it to us. And, and the way that they make albums, um, uh, the way that they make an album is they basically, they, they create their own software to generate sounds. They might be rhythmic sounds or drones or... Uh, the, the music that you heard in the film that, that I showed you, that was all tech. So that's... Uh, but but the, stuff, the stuff you heard, that was just the stuff... That was the music or the, or the sounds that they create that they then edit and make into more, formula, more formulaic or more traditional music forms. Anyway, so they came in and they said, they, they, were, they said on the phone that this was the, the, the new album, this was like the most, um, or the least human sounding album that they made. It was, it was just all about uh, creating software or some systems that, that generate repetitive sounds and things. Anyway, so they came in and, it, and the irony was that actually it sounded to me, um, I don't, you know when you have a, when you, a, a wedding, and you, I don't know if it's the same here, but in the UK it's, it's you go and sit in a, in a church, which is the only time I ever go to church. You sit, you sit uh, in there, and there's somebody playing on an organ, and it's just sort of random kind of thing. You sort of, you know, you sit there. And, it, and, it, and it's usually rubbish. But the one thing it is, is that churches have a great ambience. So I really like to, I, I kind of enjoy it because you get this kind of richness of sound. And that's what this album sounded like to me. It, it sounded like, that, although it was totally digital and totally inorganic, it, it, it sounded, um, it sounded organic, I guess. Anyway, so apart from things like religion and consumerism and, and why we do what we do and fast history and all the other, and uh, Anglo and Minutes and all those other things that, that, that guide me through my daily life, another thing that, that, that fascinates me is, is why human beings have a fascination with trying to emulate the precision of technology. I don't really kind of get it. I think that and, and then we try to create machines that, that can replicate the way, that, the way that we are as humans, which again seems like artificial intelligence is, or, or even the thing that, um, you know, when you have like those role playing games like Second Life, it's like, I, 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 I'm, I just about cope with this one, having a second one, it's like having two wives or something, it's just, it just doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, so, that, so this is basically, the, the thing is, is uh, what is it that, that a machine can do really well that a human being can't, in terms, of, in terms of graphic things? And that is to draw a circle, a perfect circle. You know, there's all these things where people try and draw perfect circles, and, and you know, where, uh, whereas using design software, you can do it in like less than a second, so they have this circle, it's done. So this whole idea of like trying to draw a perfect circle, I don't know why, I, I think that, that, that an imperfect circle is, is usually better. So what we did with this album was we worked out how many different surfaces there would be, so that in terms of the vinyl, the cover, the labels, the inner sleeves, the outer box, then there's the CD, packaging the CD on body, 
Then there's the ads, the posters, the t-shirts, etc. We worked out there'd be 72 occasions to use, uh, or 72 services. So I, I got the people in the office to make 72 attempts to design a perfect circle. Uh, some are done kind of quite small scale, some are done with really big brushes. Um, so when you see, if you, if you got every single format of the album and connected every ad or whatever, there's, there's never one circle, there's, never, there's no circles that are ever repeated. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Um, I have only one question. I mean, you've done location branding and we talked about this and I know you had a terrible experience with Montenegro Airlines, like first experience about Montenegro. So what do you see as a location branding kind of potential in Montenegro or in Qatar as in the, as in the first impression that you have? Like, if you can think of. Um. It, it, that, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult question because I think that to, 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 when you look at location branding, it's really you have to, you have to um, dissect everything and dismantle everything and see how it works. And, and, and it's also you need to know about, the, about the, the target audience for whatever you're messaging. So, I, I mean, it, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't really do that. I mean, it's, it, obviously, you know, it, it's something that, that is, that is, it is doable. But the, the, the main thing, all I can think of is how hot it is, really. That, that consumes my entire being. Thank you so much. Thank you.